<sighs> Stable coins. If the number doesn't go up, what's the point? Why not just have cash under your mattress? Well, a few years ago, that might have been a fair point. Tether was just what you used if you wanted to temporarily reduce exposure. You called it tethering. But now, well, the very future of crypto might just depend on the new breeds of stablecoins, which are emerging as we speak. So what do they do that's so clever? Why do we need them so much? And why have they got governments around the world floundering so desperately? And most importantly for you, dear watcher, how do they help you find financial freedom? All of this and more coming up. Welcome to School of Blog. Oh, and if you like the way we cut our jib, the way we light our candles, please do like and subscribe. It really does help us make more of this fine, fine content. Thank you. Let's start at the beginning. The world's first stablecoin was BitUSD, released on the 21st of July 2014. Next came NewBits, released in September 2014. Unfortunately, NewBits was governed by the controversial seigniorage system, which caused it to lose 94% of its value. Not ideal for a stablecoin. But it wasn't until Tether arrived on Bitfinex in 2015 that the concept of stablecoins took off. But what was Tether exactly? A collateralized, off-chain token backed by real assets. For every USDT, that's their token, issued, the Tether Foundation kept one US dollar in reserve, supposedly. Now this kept the USDT price stabilized around a dollar, as each unit of USDT could be redeemed for one of the US dollars in reserve. Now we're not going to get into the debate of whether a bank account somewhere really has as many dollars as there are tethers issued, as that is a deep dive documentary all of itself. But for the purposes of understanding the principles involved, let's just say that there are. Now tethers growth when it came was pretty spectacular. Its supply surpassed 1 million for the first time in January 2016. A year later, it was a little under $10 million. By the end of the last bull run in January 2018, the tether supply had grown to over $1.4 billion. And as of now, in 2021, well, oh, you get the picture, $74 billion. That is a lot. So you can see why there's a few questions as to how the founders of Tether have found that much cash to back it up. Anyway, Tether wasn't the only significant player on the market for long. USDC was launched on the Ethereum network in September 2018, also pegged to the US dollar, and in principle, backed by dollars held in reserve. And at the time of recording, there are 34 billion USDC in circulation, 34 bloody billion! It's okay, I'm all right now. Another stable coin you might have heard of is DAI. The difference here is that DAI is collateralized against ETH rather than the dollar. And as of November 2021, there's about six and a half billion dollars. Oh, I don't know why that happens. Six and a half billion dollars worth of DAI in circulation. I think now I'm ready to die. Bye. <laughs> So, why exactly do we need stablecoins? Obviously, they do something if there's this many billion dollars worth of them. Well, if we look at our standard crypto tokens as little fishing boats bobbing away on the tumultuous seas of price, then a stablecoin acts as a battleship. Let's call it USS Crypto, impervious to the ebbs and flows of blockchain supply and demand, and there to maintain peace and order. Boom, boom. Because stablecoins are the main investment vector and medium of exchange for the whole ecosystem. So whether you're a trader or investor, on-ramping, taking profits or betting on market swings, you would be in fact completely lost without them. Investors used to traditional assets see a fiat-based virtual currency as an acceptable asset class that can mitigate the damage caused by huge swings in value of the rest of their crypto portfolio. And multinationals like JP Morgan and Wells Fargo are increasingly viewing stablecoins as a lucrative new solution to settling cross-border payments. Again, avoiding the volatility of using Bitcoin or any other pumpty crypto asset. 
perhaps most importantly for the future, stablecoins are the fuel for the whole DeFi ecosystem. Without them, the DeFi market would crash. They also provide a vital bridge, there we go, between the current model and the DeFi model. So traditional finance and DeFi. Let's see if we can light this up. There we go, a vital bridge. But despite their key role in the crypto ecosystem, the current model isn't optimal. There's constant FUD about Tether's collateralization and having to trust a central entity for your stablecoin stability isn't very crypto-like either. Remember, crypto is all about a decentralized trustless system, not one that is clearly on fire. And some of these worries translate to government's interests in them. They're desperate to regulate them to reduce consumers' financial risk, like this. But perhaps more pertinently, they don't like their monetary and fiscal control of the economy being competed with by a third party who can issue currency at will. And like that, it's gone. So, what is going to happen? Firstly, regulation of some kind. Well, it's inevitable. What's that going to look like? Well, there's already a lot of chat about stablecoin issuers being regulated the same way as banks. In early November 2021, the US President's Working Group on Financial Markets called for all stablecoins to be regulated this way. And there's a worry that a run on them could cause a massive shock to the crypto economy. And when there's $78 billion worth of questionably backed tether, you can see why. Now, some governments may also try to treat them as securities, impacting on their use, not to mention denouncing them publicly. However, it's not all doom and gloom. As the President's Working Group reported that, once regulated, stablecoins could support fast, more efficient, and more inclusive payments options. They just want to control it. These stablecoins aim to use new technologies in a way that has the potential to enhance payments efficiency, speed up settlement flows, and reduce end user costs. But they may also carry potential risks to those users and to the broader financial system. The other response that governments have to stablecoins is, well, to make their own. Like this. Just admire the craftsmanship on that bad boy. Real glue. Almost every country on the planet is looking at the possibility of their own central bank digital currency, or CBDC. What exactly is a CBDC? Well, it's an electronic record or digital token of a country's official currency, issued and regulated by the nation's monetary authority or central bank. Now, there's a number of advantages for governments here, including the simplification of monetary policy, law enforcement, and tax collection, but quite a few disadvantages for you and me on the street. The biggest one of these is, of course, privacy. And to be frank, CBDCs represent one giant leap towards George Orwell's 1984. With CBDCs fully integrated into employment, taxation, and identity of every single individual, every aspect of your identity and life is available for Big Brother to monitor, and if necessary, manipulate. Because it's not just the government watching how you spend your money, they can program it too and dictate how it gets spent. For example, imagine a universal basic income with an expiration date that can only be spent on certain product categories, and then extend that to what you can and can't do with your salary or any other money you get paid. Well, the prospect is, well, it's kind of frightening. Look at China's development of the digital yuan. Now, in the second pilot stage, critics are worried that the inevitable full launch of that currency strengthens authoritarianism in a country already known for a questionable human rights record. And Europe, well, it's following suit. In July 2021, the governing council of the ECB launched the investigation phase for the digital euro. Designed to last 24 months, the investigation will ascertain how a CBDC for the whole of the eurozone would actually work. And of course, well, the US is looking into it too. The Federal Reserve is due to release a paper exploring its digital dollar, which would have national and global impacts on the financial system. The Federal Reserve's members, however, do seem to be divided on the prospect of their own CBDC, and the agency is a long way away from committing to a firm decision, but, you know, pressure from China and all that. But what does all this mean for the future? Well, there's a clear tension between stablecoins and central bank digital currencies. It's still far too early to say how it will unfold, but asset-backed stablecoins are bound to evolve under the pressure. 
and it's already happening. Algorithmic stablecoins are shaking up the crypto establishment. Instead of a central entity providing collateral, the algorithm manages the stability of the currency by either increasing, damn it, or decreasing the supply of the currency depending on the price pressures being exerted. Now the rules for these algorithmic actions are available, come on, in smart contracts. So the rules can only be changed by leveraging social consensus or through governance votes. Now the most well-known algorithmic stablecoin right now is built on Terra and it's called UST. And it's now the fifth biggest overall based on market cap. In contrast to other designs of algorithmic stablecoin though, UST relies solely on arbitrage to maintain its stability or peg. Now when UST is below its peg, arbitragers can mint a token called Luna by buying and burning UST. And then when it's above the peg, they can mint UST by buying and burning Luna. It takes a bit to get your head around, but it works. Another example is Reserve, which uses aggregated baskets of tokenized assets to create their stablecoin. Now these assets could include commodities, debt, and even equities. And take a look at Olympus, which is building a community-owned, decentralized, algorithmic stablecoin, which of course is much more in keeping with the fundamental principles of crypto. Now one of the differences with its currency, Ohm, is that it functions more like the gold standard. Here, Ohm will never dip under a dollar, see, just Yep, but it could rise far, far higher. Managed by game theory, it's built so users are incentivized to stake or buy bonds. And as such, it's perhaps more accurate to call it a backed asset rather than a stable coin. With over $200 billion now locked up in DeFi alone, there's no question that the growth of crypto would have had a very different path if it weren't for the creation of stable coins. They are the oil that makes the crypto machine function. And without them, it would grind to... You finished? To a halt. No more liquidity, no more institutions. And what happens then? Yes, the number goes down. Now, whether you personally use them or not, it's in all of our interests to understand the role they play. And especially given how contentious they are for governments, will asset-backed stablecoins be regulated out of existence? Or will regulation encourage USDC and Tether to show their balance sheets and knock the FUD on the head once and for all? I'll tell you somebody I wanna knock on the head. And as with CBDCs, it's too early to say, but this space, as we always say, is moving quickly and decentralized options are likely going to be here to stay. You've been watching School of Block presented by Ledger and The Defiant, demystifying decentralization one very, very greasy block at a time. Don't forget to subscribe, drop us a like if that's what you're into, and as always, here's to your extremely well-lubricated freedom. Lay it on me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's like taking a warm bath in prosperity. Mmm. And stop. Conflicted feelings here. <laughs>